We would like to thank Biogen and Scholar Rock for their generous support of this symposium. So it is my pleasure to introduce you all to Kimberly Cook, who will be discussing navigating the educational system. As an inclusion professional, Kimberly focuses on access to the curriculum for all learners. She serves educators, students, and parents through her work with class, access curriculum together as an adjunct instructor at Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi and as a national presenter with Cure SMA. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Advertising from the University of Texas in Austin and a Master's in Educational Administration and Mid-Management from Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. That's a tongue twister. Kimberly, thank you so much for being here today. We're so excited to, to hear what you have to share with us and we'll now turn the time over to you. Okay, we're going to talk today about navigating special education and a little bit about assistive technology. And I'll also talk somewhat about transitioning into college. I have a few disclaimers though. One, there when we talk about special education, there are federal laws and there are state laws. And I come from Texas where the laws are a little bit different. I mean, they are underneath the federal laws, but we have a, a few things that are a little different. So just bear that in mind because um, I know you all from a different location. I also, um, when I make decisions for children, as far as special education and education goes, I look at all aspects of the child. We've got not only need to look at them physically and cognitively, but it's really important to me to look at the emotional needs of the child um, and the social needs as well. Um, and another thing I like to look at, a lot of teachers that I run into in the communities that I serve are all into equality, and that is great. Um, they want to give all the children the same supports and make it equal, but we really need to look at equity to make sure that our students are getting what they need to level the playing field for students. And then the true sense of the world, we would like true liberation where um, obstacles are removed so we do not have to continue to adapt the environment for our children. The federal um, law that we're going to talk about is the Individuals with uh, Disabilities Education Act and you'll often hear it referred to as an acronym of IDEA. IDEA requires the inclusion and education of students with special needs. And I highlight the word requires because oftentimes different school districts have a different idea of what inclusion um, means for children with disabilities. And it has a lot to do with cultural norms and state laws and the needs of the family. But um, inclusion is what is required. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means. IDEA requires um, that children who qualify for special education services, they are given a specialized ac um, academic plan. And we refer to this as an IEP, or the Individualized Education Program for a Child. So every child that qualifies for services has their own individual education plan. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. The first thing we have to do is determine eligibility. And the big requirement, first off, is the child, does the child have a disability? Um, oftentimes, kids with SMA um, are obviously have a disability, but I met a young man the other day at a Cure SMA conference who was just diagnosed with SMA a few years ago and he had um, type three, and he was telling me how difficult it was for him to get services because he did not look disabled. Um, he uh, was ambulatory and he just had difficulty navigating steps and that kind of thing. So your school district, um, depending on your child, will have to get um, like a note from a doctor or some sort of evidence that shows the child does have a disability. Sometimes it's easier for some of our kids and other kids. Um, there are 
13 different categories covered under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. There are two eligibility criteria or categories that our kids generally um, fall under. And that's typically, in my experience, has been other health impairment or orthopedic impairment. And I just want to say that it does not matter what the category is for eligibility because every education plan is individualized. So there shouldn't, um, it should, does not make a difference just so they do qualify to get those services if they're needed. The other health impairment category, the definition of that is having limited strength, vitality, with respect to the educational environment, and that is critical. It has to be limited strength and vitality with respect to the educational environment, and it has to be due to a chronic health condition. Um, and it, another important thing is it has to adversely affect a child's educational performance. So the, there's a lot going on here. It's not just about having a disability, but that it's due to a chronic or acute health condition and that it adversely affects a child's educational performance. Okay, the second step is, is there an educational need? So let's take that apart just a little bit. First of all, you have to have assessments that are required in all areas of suspected disability. Um, so if you feel like your child needs help um, physically, a physical therapist might do an assessment. Oftentimes for kids with SMA, an occupational therapist will also do an assessment. Another area is PE. Um, they might qualify for adapted physical education. Um, because your student is still required to master the, the physical ed standards. So um, they might require adaptive PE in order to access those goals. And I have to say, if the school district doesn't suspect a need, but you do, you need to put it in writing. Um, I always say go with your gut. Oftentimes children with SMA might have um, difficulty with speech and language. Um, the school district doesn't feel like they do. Your child does have a difficulty with uh, speech and language, and you do still put the request in writing, and your school district will have to do an assessment. You can request evaluations through your child's teacher, the school psychologist, the school's principal, and honestly, you can write it down in a note and give it to a bus driver. The school district still has to will still be receiving that information and the timeline sort of goes from there. Um, the district has, according to federal law, they have 60 school days. In Texas, we have 30, it's a little different. Um, from the date of your approval to complete the evaluation. So your school district has to give you a form telling you about all the assessments they want to do for your child and you have to sign off on that and give them approval. This is in addition to your request for an evaluation. So just because you've requested it, the timeline doesn't start until you've actually signed the consent form. Um, if you receive a copy of the assessment in advance, read it thoroughly. Um, and if you didn't receive a copy of the assessment prior to the meeting, I recommend you don't sign anything. Uh, during the IEP meeting, just because you need time to process the results. And sometimes it's hard to navigate all this new language and all, all this new information. The school is required to do a reevaluation every three years. So those assessments will have to be done every three years and the school will have to get your consent for those. Um, there is an IEP review annually and during those reviews, you can make changes in your child's educational plan because um, our kids needs change. Um, their physical needs change, their environmental needs change, um, their academic needs change. So 
Um, they are required to review the plan annually, but also know you can call a meeting yourself. If you feel like things aren't going well, you can call the school district and say, I would like to review my child's IEP and they will have to put a meeting together for you. You can do that as often as you need to, but it is a minimum requirement of annually. Okay, let's look at what the individualized education program might look like for your child. There's sort of a few steps you have to go through. One, like we talked about, there has to be an educational need identified. If a need is identified, then goals are created. And the reason goals are created is so you can determine progress. Um, so if the occupational therapist has goals, they will have to document progress on those goals to you um, when the report cards come out so you can see if progress is being made. Um, and then the services that need to need to be provided in the area of need. So let's look at what is in the IEP and honestly, it can be a very, very big document. Don't let it scare you. Um, just review it. Um, ask for ask the school district to explain things to you. I've been to hundreds of IEP meetings probably, and I recently went to an IEP meeting at a new district and the meeting was going so fast. I couldn't even keep up with what was going on much less a poor parent. So you just have to say, stop, wait, um, we need to, everybody needs to be on the same page. Um, Cause there'll be a lot of new acronyms and just new language that you won't be familiar with. But in the IEP, the school district will put um, document present levels of performance. And that just means where your child is as far as occupational therapy goals or fine motor skill goals where your child is currently as far as speech and language goals, um, academic goals. So the pres present levels of performance will be written in all the areas of need. Uh, the IEP has to address the student's unique needs. Is your child really uh, sociable? Um, are they fearful of environmental situations? Anything that's unique to your child needs to be addressed and talked about in this meeting. Um, a big thing is the free appropriate public education. Um, and you'll ought is another acronym that you'll hear um, regarded as FAPE. And it includes related services. And so appropriate education is your child being in the educational setting with goals and objectives. And the key here is also free because when I um, go to different webinars and seminars with QSMA, I am often surprised to hear school districts requiring parents to come in and toilet their child during school. And that is not appropriate. It is not free. Um, the school district is required to assist your child in any way possible that keeps your child in school. So toileting your if your child needs assistance in toileting, the school district needs to help with that. And often a paraprofessional will serve that um, service, um, but that person needs to be trained. Um, so this public education should be free um, to you as a family. Also in the IEP, you'll have goals and objectives to measure progress. And it will also include modifications and accommodations. And these two words seem similar, but they're very different. Modifications are when the curriculum is changed. That means your child doesn't have to master the same curriculum that the kids being served under general education have to master. And typically, I don't see a lot of modifications for our children with SMA because typically they're so bright. Um, but the accommodations is typically what I see more of because those are just things that help support your child in mastering those grade level mod um, standards. An accommodation could be um, maybe text uh, speech to text software or um, extra time in the hallways to get from class to class, that kind of thing. So it doesn't change what they're learning, 
but it just they just give your child support. And the last one is the least restrictive environment needs to be addressed. And by law, the school district and your IEP meeting participants have to consider general education classrooms as the least restrictive. Um, and from there, you can talk about what kind of supports your child needs in the general ed classroom. Um, but the least restrictive would be the general ed classroom. So if you have special education, separate educational classrooms for kids with disabilities, that becomes more restrictive. And I don't typically find that our children need a separate environment, sometimes, but not always. Okay, during your uh, meeting, IEP goals will be developed. Um, this is an example of a child requiring the use of a portable word processing tablet um, and specialized apps to help with graphic word organization, graphic organization, presentation, voice recognition, word prediction, um, and requiring access to Wi-Fi. Um, but what I highlighted here in this word periodically in red Please try to avoid any words like that in your goals because I, I mean, my, I have a, an adult son with SMA and I know going through school, how many times we had communication gaps because in my mind, periodically meant several times a day and in the school's mind, periodically meant several times a semester. So be sure you understand uh, what they mean. So I would just literally put in there the frequency three times a day and maybe even the times. You want to be very specific so you know your child's getting the services they need. Um, the goal will also have a begin date and end date, and that's typically that year um, between IEP meetings. And then, of course, you have to have who is going to provide the services. And in this instance, occupational therapist uh, usually helps support um, adaptive equipment and then of course the special education teacher would be supportive in that area as well okay let's look at the actual iep meeting it's changed a lot in the past couple of years they used to always have to be in person but since covid um, we have learned that iep meetings can be virtual so your school district might offer you the opportunity to be virtual or in person. And honestly, um, virtual helps when parents have to work and have a hard time getting off work. But I also recommend in person because that's how you establish relationships. Um, and relationships are vital when we're talking about our kids and the services they get at school. Who's at the table when you have an IEP meeting? The law requires, the federal law requires a certain number of people must attend. First, you have to have a special education teacher because they have been educated in how to access the environment, academics, social opportunities, and adapt those things for children with disabilities. You also have to have a district representative, like a principal or assistant principal because they are the ones that sign off on the document saying, yes, the school can provide these services and they will. The diagnostician must be there because she or he is the one that will um, explain the assessments. And so that's vital, especially for someone like me who I was not familiar with um, OT or PT services. So that diagnostician was very important to me in explaining what the test results meant. You also have to have a general educator because remember the general education classroom has to be considered first in any placement decisions for a child with a disability. And then I put in green, the parent is invited because I want you to go. <laughs> it is imperative that you attend this meeting you know more about your child than any of the other people sitting at the table and you want to have some, you need to have a lot of input. And from my experience, I have taught in public schools for 30 years and my son is the only child with SMA I've ever encountered. So your school 
is not familiar with the needs of your child. And more often than not, they need you to help them figure it out. Um, so oftentimes you just, your presence is and your information is very, very important to the school in serving your child. Okay. You can also have other people attend the meeting. The law requires your student at the age of 16 of attend, but I would really like to encourage you, um, to have your child attend from the very beginning. My son Spencer attended when he was five years old. I don't know why, maybe I couldn't find a babysitter, but it was like the best thing ever because he could watch me advocate for him and watch. And so I could model how to advocate and get along with people and um, enrich those relationships. So, and also the student being in the meeting helps with buy-in, they're helping making decisions. And the older the student gets, I think the more important it is that your student participates. I know I, my son was in a standard twice a day in high school, and I don't think he'll still forgive me for that, but um, he, I should have been listening to him more in retrospect. Okay, the school psychologist can be there, the adaptive PE teacher, especially if adaptive PE is recommended, the speech and language uh, pathologist, the OT, the PT, and the last one I have bulleted here is an advocate, friend, or family member. And I recommend that just because sometimes it's difficult to hear these assessment results. I know it was for me. I often didn't want to know, you know, how difficult um, school was for my son. So a friend or another family member can often help you remember things and take notes for you and just be a support for you. Okay, one thing I do run into is the difference between school-based occupational therapy and medical-based occupational therapy, and they're very different. But OT on a school-based basis, their whole goal is to ensure access and participation in the educational setting like accessing books in a locker, accessing pencils, accessing uh, different centers in the classroom. Uh, they also assist in preparation for transition after graduation. So how will your student go from being in the school setting uh, to being in the community? And another big thing that's important, and I don't see it happening a lot, but the service should occur in the location and time that the student is expecting experiencing challenges. So often I see children removed from the classroom to get OT services, and then they're missing academic time. Um, and so the OT really should be going into the classroom so they can see where the difficulties are and help your child um, access those environments or those things. School-based physical therapy focuses on functional mobility, how the student gets around the school, um, and they also ensure safe, efficient access and participation in educational activities and routines in all the natural learning environments. How does your student get to the locker? How do they get to um, the cafeteria? Um, that kind of thing. So that's different than medically based occupational therapy as well. Oops, hold on. Okay, also during the IEP meeting, assistive technology must be considered, and I had not been familiar with that term, but it can be any item, like literally anything, any kind of equipment or a product system. And it can be bought commercially, like purchased off the internet or in a store, it can be something that's modified or made for your child. And the whole idea that it's used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a child with a disability. I always feel uh, that low tech assistive technology is best. So it can mean something as simple as a dowel stick to push buttons, or Spencer's second grade teacher was just fabulous he couldn't raise his hand, so she got him a dowel stick and painted the end red, and he just raised a dowel stick to raise his hand. I mean, a beautiful, very simple way to give him access um, 
and participation in the classroom. We also a hook on a wheelchair can hold a dog leash or keys or mask. And then pencil grips are often overlooked to help our children hold on to a pencil. I like raised line paper because often it's difficult for our kids to um, maintain stability on a paper. So just a raised line can be helpful in stopping the pencil from moving. And also an ink stamp of a signature. Instead of writing their name at the top of the paper, just use an ink stamp because we always want to um, save their um save their um power and all that kind of stuff okay assistive technology there are some um websites that i wanted to leave with you one is called wati.org and it comes it's a uh, wisconsin assistive technology initiative um, and it has different chapters for um different areas of need like chapter two is assistive technology for seating, positioning, and, no, and mobility. Chapter three is assistive technology for communication. Chapter four uh, is AT for computer access. So there's many different chapters here. And I once printed the book out. I don't know why. It was like six inches thick. So it is a beautiful resource of information. So if your child or you have difficulties with positioning, um, you can go down, download chapter two and it will give you some resources um, and information that can be very helpful. So I highly recommend wadi.org. Another website that can be very helpful is bookshare.org. And this was a grant that was funded several years ago, but it gives you free books for anyone with a disability related to print. So if you have physical limitations and can't hold a book or pick up a book, that would qualify you for um, free literature. I teach at the university and all my textbooks that I use in my classes are part of this Bookshare initiative. Um, so they're free, so it saves money for my college students, but it's also a great um, resource in elementary, middle, and high school because your textbooks and uh, novels will be here, also magazines. Um, and so it's pretty easy to get started, but I would recommend you go to bookshare, uh, bookshare.org because digital books can be so much easier for our kids than a physical book as well. Another thing I want you to consider are emergency plans, and we often don't think about this, but it needs and must be part of your IE plan, IEP plan. If something happens on campus and your child needs to be removed from the setting, how is that going to happen? Um, I would recommend that you actually have a literal person responsible. Um, and just, and I think I, um, a friend of mine has a student that uses a wheelchair and they had a beautiful emergency plan. And fortunately it was a fire drill, but her son was left at the stop top of the stairway by himself while the rest of the campus evacuated. Uh, that doesn't work. Your child needs to be removed from the setting with everyone else. And often the elevators are not usable, especially during a fire. Um, so just be sure you have a plan um, in place and that it is in writing and part of your IEP. Okay, another good resource is um, a website that is put on by the federal government and it is called IDEA, Individuals with Dis Disabilities Education Act. Um, and the U.S. Department of Education is, is responsible for that. So that can be a, a helpful resource as well. Okay, there's something called five, Section 504, and it is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. And what it does is it just ensures that your child with a disability has equal access to an education. And it is best basically a set of accommodations like extended time for test taking or raised line paper or a paraprofessional to assist in the bathroom. 
but it can also be changes in the classroom environment. But the whole goal is to help your child follow the regular curriculum. It is much less formal than an IEP and much less involved, and it does not change instruction itself. So many times uh, schools want to qualify a child with a disability under 504, and sometimes it's under an IEP. And another big difference is a 504 is not funded um, by the government like an IEP is. So I don't, I don't know if that's important or not, but it's just interesting. Um, and you cannot have a 504 and still be uh, have a spe uh, IEP. It has to be one or the other. So that is really up to you and your school district. Um, but they're given accommodations to sort of level the playing field. And some ideas can be extra time between classes and on assessments. Um, you could have a peer helper or an elevator key. Um, accessible instructional materials. But the curriculum is not customized for the student and there's, you don't have to have a written plan. And remember, an IEP is a contractual agreement between you and the school. Um, a 504 does not give you that. Support, okay, just to give you some ideas of what some kids IEPs might look like. This is Julian. He is a young man on the East coast. Um, when he first went to kindergarten. He um, he's qualified for an IEP prior to the start of kindergarten. His mom contacted the school before he started. Um, he had options for recess and field day and field trips. Um, he also was given pre-cut materials and a fountain pen for writing and some self-opening scissors because it was real important to conserve energy um, and oftentimes in the kindergarten classroom, cutting and pasting is a big part of the things they're doing. So the materials can be pre-cut for kids. Also preferential uh, seating in the classroom. Um, Julian sat close to the cafeteria door, so he his tray could be brought to him um, easily. He also had a personal iPad with dictation. And at that time, we didn't have digital books like Bookshare, so he had an extra set of textbooks at home, so he didn't have to carry them back and forth to school. In middle school and high school, he went into OT and PT as, on a consultation basis only, which just meant those specialists went into the classroom to see how he's doing and he didn't get one-on-one -on -one therapy. He still received prefer, uh, preferential seating and extended time on all assessments. And I want to emphasize here that be sure whether you're on a 504 or have an IEP, that that is documented. So when your child goes to college and needs to take SAT or ACT tests, that you can qualify for extended time on those um, tests. Um, also an extra set of textbooks, and he also had a scribe for longer writing tasks. And he did adaptive PE, or he could stretch outside of class, one or, the, um, one or the other. This is my son, Spencer. We live in South Texas, and so it's interesting how his accommodations are very similar to Julian's. Um, he did use a standard twice a day, and we did have staff trained on transfers in and out of his standard and in the bathroom. Uh, he used AFOs, and so the physical therapist assisted with that. And he had goals for building strength and stamina. Uh, and we also had the emergency, emergency of actual evacuation consult, and one person was tied to that responsibility. Um, we did have to train the physical therapist, train the staff on uh, transferring for toileting um, and consulting with the PE teacher for appropriate activities. The occupational therapist worked with technology needs and he used an alternative keyboard um, and he had exercises to increase his pincher grip for handwriting. He also used a speech recognition software and at that time it was drag and dictation. I think there are a lot more options now and it's a lot easier to use. But we had some further goals to improve strength and stamina to help him access books. 
And then of course we had to have automatic door openers on exterior doors installed at the school so he could have independent access for safety as well as independence. Um, we always had a paraprofessional on duty to assist Spencer, but only when called and he did it via walkie talkie. Um, and I think this is a critical point. Oftentimes I have parents that feel like their child needs a paraprofessional one-on-one, -on -one, a paraprofessional that will always um, be taking care of the needs of their child. But I feel so strongly against that because it isolates our children socially. The other kids don't want to come be friends with a person that has an adult hovering around them um, very often. So, I, he did have a paraprofessional who Spencer was his primary responsibility, but he also went and did janitorial things. It was a small school, so he also mowed the yard. He also helped other children in the classroom, and he accompanied Spencer on field trips. Uh, we also had a service dog that assisted uh, Spencer. And then also transportation services uh, adapted bus for wheelchair access, so he could go to school with the neighborhood kids. Okay, one thing I want to emphasize that, and I find this with my students now, uh, that suddenly the school has been responsible for all these accommodations and all these services, but when your child goes to college, the student is responsible for the accommodations, not the school personnel. So that means the student has to go to disability services to let them know there is a need, to say, hey, I'm out here, I need help. Um, there are some resources to know about the National Center for College Students with Disabilities. And in Texas, we have the Texas Workforce Commission and they helped um, Spencer when he went to college, they paid for attendant care, they paid for his um, college tuition, they paid for a few support services um, because their goal is to help people with disabilities become employable. So they were very helpful. And if you have an organization like this in your area, I would invite the representative that's going to work with your child to come to IEP meetings uh, in high school so he can or she can get an understanding of what's going on and what the goals are. Um, when you're considering, considering colleges and universities, um, I knew Spencer wanted to be major in architecture. And of course, I was so nervous letting him go to school, especially if it was not going to be in our city. Um, it was very scary for me as a mom. And so I probably overdid it, but I learned so much. I spoke to the deans of the School of Architecture at Texas Tech, University of Texas at Austin, Rice University, and the University of Texas at San Antonio. And although the law protects our kids, I have just found that often it is how is people, how they feel about people with disabilities more than anything else. What's their attitude? And I found um, one of these schools was definitely not going to tolerate or do any accommodations. And then other universities were absolutely beautiful and made all the accommodations necessary for Spencer to be successful. So I would recommend you know, forming those relationships and finding out what you can. Also, when you choose your school, um, contact the disability services because they will have assistive technology specialists. So verify that and know who your person is. Um, find out what kind of assistive technology is available. As often, um, of it, you can find that out on the website. But you also need to go apply for disability services and look at accessible housing and campus clubs and activities and that kind of thing. Um, the things that um, my school offers are digital books, text readers, copies of notes, um, but it's important that, and often my students will get extended time on tests, but my students have to come tell me, okay, I'm a student with a disability, here's my letter from disability services, and I need extended time on this test and they have they're responsible for telling me every time we have a test. Otherwise, I assume they don't need support. So, I mean, it's a big change from public school. 
Spencer did go to college with a service dog. Um, I look in retrospect, um, the service dog was for more for me than for him because it made, made me feel a little safer or made me feel like he was safer. Um, I recommend planning ahead um, and confirming attendant care. Spencer needed full support as far as changing clothes, toileting, showering, all that kind of thing. So we had to find a caregiver. Uh, we had to find accessible housing. Um, the automatic doors at the um, architecture school were not available. They were installed very quickly. That was a surprise, but that's something we had to check out. And then academic accommodations. Um, Spencer was given a different drafting table. He was able to hire model builders for his architectural models, which was beautiful. Uh, he also used AutoCAD, which is a software system that usually isn't used until you're a sophomore, um, but they allowed him to use that as a freshman just because he couldn't draw, um, you know, on those big tables. Then he also took his service dog to school. Things we should have thought of, um, form a relationship with the re wheelchair repair team. Spencer got stuck in the rain in the middle of the street and his wheelchair stopped. Um, and we did not have any, we did not have a relationship. So I highly recommend you have a relationship with someone and also a medical team. I always thought that if he got sick, he'd come home. But when he got sick, he got sick and was in ICU. Um, and he had, didn't have time to come home. So it turned out well, and those people are still his medical team, but it just was a little scary for me as his mom, not knowing who the people were. So those are things I would recommend. Um, there are a lot of life lessons in all this. Um, I think communication is critical, especially when you're talking to school personnel. And like I said, these, School personnel are not familiar with children with SMA. And even if they are, our kids with SMA have such different support needs. So I think it's really important that you as parents or caregivers, grandparents um, are good communicators. Uh, once a wall is built between you, it's often different, difficult to break that wall down. Um, I hate to say take cookies to the IEP meeting, but that doesn't hurt. Um, but just be open and understand often your school districts don't know what to do um, and they're doing their best. Um, so just be open in those discussions. And often it's you really have to think outside the box. Um, some of these challenges, some of our kids challenges are different. Um, I think about the evacuation route, uh, and when Spencer was in third grade, this probably would be illegal now. I don't know, but um, he used a he used reciprocal gate orthesis. So they were he used a walker and braces that he could um, sort of walk with, and he used as as a stander at his desk. So during um, when the fire alarm went off, we did not have time to take the braces off, put him in his wheelchair and get him out the door. So we ended up getting uh, dollies and bungee cords and we just put him on the dolly, strap him in and wheel him out. And he was usually the first person out of the building because that designated person was on it. Was that the safest thing? I don't know, but we were definitely thinking outside the box. Um, and just, just know everybody Typically, everyone you work with cares and they're doing their best. Um, I'd say leaving home and going to school is not easy. It was very, very difficult. I know when we dropped Spencer off, my husband and I looked at each other and thought, you think he'll call us before we get home? Because we were three and a half hours away. Would he call us in a week to come home? You know, we were on pins and needles wondering if he was going to make it. Um, and it was very, very challenging. Not always the best things happen, but I think that's part of life. And we all learn from those things. And in the end, he was very accepted by his academic community. Uh, he did graduate with a degree in architecture. Um, and he currently works as a um, accessibility specialist in Austin. Um, was it worth it? Yes, he got married in February, which 
we were very excited about. It was beautiful. Michaela loves Spencer through and through. Uh, and I think you can tell from this picture. Um, he also uh, drives, which scared me to death because, oh my goodness, how, anyway, <laughs> now I realize that driving is probably safer than cruising down the sidewalk and on the streets all the time. So driving is better. Um, and he, and I think all the academic and the difficulties we had getting him included in um, his classrooms. I mean, I, I was the, I was the um, special ed director in his school from K through eight. So I had control, which was beautiful. It was great. But when he went to high school, they immediately wanted to put him in a separated classroom for children with disabilities. And I had to fight tooth and nail. I mean, he was so bright. And then to put him in a separate setting just seemed just not right to me. And I think all the effort was worth it because he is included in a community and he expects to be participating in that community. Um, and he's a big important part of his community as well. Um, he recently uh, put a short film together. Uh, he won, and I hope it will become public sometime so that you can see it. It's um, just a 20 minute show that follows the life of Stuart, a disabled man whose life is a mess. And it really explores the tension between self, uh, between reliance on other people and true independence and just his um, learning that lesson that none of us are truly independent. Uh, we all depend on each other in our lives, but it is called Act of God. And I am happy to answer any questions that anybody has, if there are any. Thank you so much, Kimberly. That was some wonderful information, not only about navigating the whole process, but putting in your personal experiences. Well, thank you very much. They have, it's been an interesting life. <laughs> so it sounds like the transition from high school to college for you all was not necessarily difficult, but maybe a little bit unexpected the process yeah and, and it was the first um caregiver spencer had was not the greatest and so that was difficult uh he, he got through it and none of us liked it but it was just like we he just wanted to push through and go to school and leaving home was very important to him so he's had great caretakers since then but it was a hard transition um, we are, if you have questions, um, you can use the chat box at the lower right of your screen and we'll be looking for those for a few moments. Um, if you don't mind me asking Kimberly in terms of Spencer, um, you said it was important for him to leave home uh -huh. as a I parent. <laughs> go ahead. How did you, what was your perceived? How do you think that affected his, his self esteem and, and his self-worth being able to leave home and go to college. Oh, I think it was monumental. Oh my goodness. He would be a whole different person if he had stayed home, I think. Yeah, he's very independent now. And I always tell him, I still tell him, he's 35 years old now. And I still tell him when you need help, ask us. And we're always here to help you. But I feel like if I step in and help him, that mm -hmm. I'm telling him I don't trust him. You know, so it's, it's that was a hard transition for me to, you know, be so involved in his life and all the decisions and to give that up. It took a lot of time, but it was a transition. Absolutely. So it looks like we have a comment. It's not a question, but um, Cindy just wanted to say a big thank you. This was very valuable. Um, we just started navigating the IEP process with my three-year-old SMA type one child and can relate to many of the things you mentioned in the few short months. Well, they've I, been doing this. Well, I would like to say I, uh, oh, I have my contact information on the last slide. I guess I didn't get there yet, but awesome. I, I am very, very happy. I have, um, when I do talks for um, Cure SMA, I have lots of parents contact me about just specific questions or whole situations, and I'm happy to talk with you. 
Perfect. Do you want to put that slide back up to, to show your information? Sure. Let's see. Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> Where did it go? I'm not sure where it went. Well, I tell you what, if you want, you can either just type it in the chat for us. Oh, why don't I do that? Um, and then that way everybody can just kind of have that and um, copy and paste that and, and keep that for their records. Okay. Yeah, because I'm happy to work with anybody. I mean, that's, I feel like I've learned so much that I would like to share. Thank you. So Kimberly <laughs> will put her contact information there in the chat. Um, also, for anybody who is in the chat, Marissa has posted a couple of links about our K through 12 education um, access um, workshop that you can um, go and, and go through that. And then we also have one on accessing higher education. So those links are in the chat. Oh, great. Um, so Kimberly has put her information um, in the chat. Um, we, I don't see any more questions coming in for you, but I want to say thank you on behalf of everybody who's joined us today for sharing such wonderful um, information and your time and expertise with our community today. Very happy to do it. Thank you. You're welcome.